works. Good afternoon. We already have a question there. Okay. Okay, I keep you for the for the first question. It's for you. Okay, so start thinking about yes. it. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for joining us for this uh, great event. Um, let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, Michela Petronio uh, from Barilla. She is vice president uh, of Global Discovery, the Global Discovery Center, something with a great name that probably you are going to explain what the, does it mean. But also she is director of Blue 1877, which is the corporate venture for, uh, for Barilla. Okay? And uh, we also have with us uh, uh, Tomas Mastrobuoni. Uh, even his name is uh, clearly Italian. He comes from the States. Uh, so uh, we have a nice mix here from uh, someone from Europe, someone from, uh, from the States. He is, uh, Thomas is a, a chief uh, financial officer from uh, Tyson New Ventures, which is the corporate venture of Tyson. Uh, for those who maybe are not familiar, Tyson is one of the huge players of the meat industry in the, in the States. And uh, he is in charge of uh, sourcing the investment, I mean, getting the money in, <laughs> and evaluating and monitoring the portfolio, so getting the money out. <laughs> One day, yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, please uh, welcome them. And I would, uh, I would like to start with a question from, uh, for both of you. Uh, you both come from uh, food brands f or food producing companies, why investing in connected kitchen or a smart kitchen or this kind of uh, uh, new market for the, the kind of uh, companies like you are? What does it make sense for companies like you? Okay, thank, thanks also for inviting us. So we are a private-owned company and uh, I mean uh, we, our long-term commitment is to provide food that we say is good for you and good for the planet. And uh, the Mediterranean diet and the Italian lifestyle is the place where our brands want to play. So when it comes to our products, eventually we produce pasta and bakery products and sauces. So uh, we were funded 140 years ago and the products were used in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And still we use pasta and we prepare pasta and bakery products, bread in the kitchen. So the kitchen today and the kitchen of the future is absolutely something we are interested in. And that's why um, some years ago, we decided to start a project and to invest in uh, a connected oven with uh, a meal kit offering, which is Cucina, Cucina Marilla. Marilla. Exactly. Right. And at the time, where startups were not around. So, uh, but still. That's uh, the place where we want to play today, in the future. So we were trying to design the future and uh, to imagine which could be a connected kitchen in the future. And today we are here, I mean, and this is becoming a reality. So that's a perfect place for us to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, for you, I think uh, the, your investment uh, strategy is uh, uh, supported in two pillars, two main pillars. What, the, what is the connected kitchen? What is the place in, in, in these two pillars? Sure. Um, so we have two core investment pillars we focus on. The first is sustainability, and we subdivide that into alternative proteins, eliminating food waste, addressing food security, and addressing food deserts. Um, for us, the Internet of Food is our second pillar, and that's where the Connected Kitchen uh, platforms fit into. Um, we are a publicly traded company. We're about 85 years old. We have 122,000 uh, team members around the world. Um, and we produce one in every five pounds of protein that's consumed in the United States. Um, so we have a, a major impact on what people are eating day to day, both through our retail sales in our trade pack products, but also in our food service products. So for us, as we see generational shifts away from eating out and eating back in the home, and people want more connectivity, they want to, it's the sharing economy, but it's also the social sharing. So people want to, through Instagram or Pinterest, they want to share what they're cooking, they want to know what their peers are cooking. Um, so we found this to be a really interesting area for us to get better consumer data. Where are consumer preferences going? Where are these trends going? We do, we do big really well. Um, we do about 34 million kilos of prepared food per week uh, out of our facilities. 
but we're very reactive to where people taste preferences are going. So for us to get more proactive, get ahead of trends, and introduce new products, and be not play catch up and use our scale to get in the front of the pack, but to use our insights, we need that data. So that's why we're investing in these areas. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned before that there were, when Barilla started the Cucino Barilla, uh, startups were not around. So it seems that uh, innovation right now, it's uh, happening more in the startup side than in the corporation. So um, it, it, what is your vision about innovation and what is the role you think as a corporation uh, have to play uh, in, the, in the relationship with the, with the startups? Okay, so I think innovation is uh, only a mean to, to, to be relevant and to, to be always relevant for our consumers. So it's, I mean, have been around in the food industry for, I would say, more than 25 years, and I've heard about uh, new emerging technologies that, I mean, have been considered emerging for 30 years. So still, I mean, consumers, they don't care about innovation and technologies. They don't, really don't care about uh, the tech side. So they want good food, tasty food, healthy food, and safe food, and food which doesn't harm the planet. So to, for us, I think innovation is a, a way to solve the challenges that are related to the food system, which are the big paradoxes we still have, and maybe today we, have, we haven't talked too much about the, 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 the thing that, I mean, there are uh, people that are dying for ex excess of food, people that still, they don't have access to food, uh, we are using our land uh, for uh, fuel, for feed, maybe we should use more land for food. And, and then the problem of food waste that we have been mentioned also today. So uh, we, we waste more food than the food that we need for people in need. So um, innovation is important because we all together and we, of course also with the new actors, the newcomers to the food the industry, I mean, innovation is the way we have to solve uh, problems, the problems that are our problems. So it's mm -hmm. important, absolutely. In your case? Yeah, I, I would say um, we've sort of said innovation is, is that, that, that boat has sailed and we're on to disruption now. Um, so we're, we're focusing, the startups that we're focusing on are really out um, in some ways to get us, right? If you look at, if you look at some of the investments we've made, I, I heard some people talk earlier about sacrificing sacred cows. I mean, for the largest protein producer in the United States to invest in a plant-based protein and two cultured meat investments, um, let's, I'm not on a lot of Christmas card lists at work right now, but um, for us to go out and do that, I think it sends the message that the technology is, is starting to hit the food industry Mm -hmm. um, we saw it hit media first, fastest and hardest, because it was easy to do, and then it went financial services, and then it went to healthcare, and now it's starting to impact food. Um, if you look like a, a company like Beyond Meat, um, people talk about it as a plant-based, it's really a technology company, if you think about it. They're, they're reassembling molecules to make plants look, taste, and mouthfeel of meat, which is incredible tech. If you're like, oh, it's a great food company, it is. It's a technology business. Um, if you look at the inv other investments we've made in tech, like Tovala, which is a connected kitchen device with a meal plan subscription attached to it, people were saying, well, you do prepared food. Why do you want to do that? Well, yeah, I do, but I know people's, their tendencies, their preferences are changing, so we're going to go along mm -hmm. with that. It's interesting because a, a technology company like Delivery wants to be the definitive food company, and the food companies want to be technology companies. So it's the, uh, yeah. you know, uh, funny uh, where were we are looking, but we maybe we are not mentioning something that when we talk with the venture corporates uh, uh, or venture capitalists, it's uh, the money. Show me the money. The end. At the end, uh, everybody wants to do business, so it's uh, it's great to want to do a better world, to to get a better flavors, convenience, healthy things. But at the end. Uh, uh, what you are looking is uh, results and, uh, and uh, business and business models. So what are you looking for beyond these great things like uh, helping people solve their problems? Sure. Um, so we've What looked... kind of companies, what kind of innovation, what kind of startups from the business point of view? Sure. Um, so we've looked at, we've done five investments since we started about a year ago. Um, we've, we, in our pipeline, we have about 600 companies that we've looked at seriously, and we've probably said no to about two times that. Um, so we've looked at almost 2,000 companies in about a year, um, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, uh, since it's me and one other guy doing this. Um, but it, it tells you 
the amount of times we have to say no for exactly those reasons. Really great idea, super entrepreneur, really bad business plan. Um, everyone, so the ones we say no to the most are ones that come in and say, how soon can you get me into Walmart? Or how soon can you get me into every Kroger supermarket in the country? And we're like, okay, we'll slow down a little. How much do you produce a week? Well, we're up to about 100 pounds of product a week. Like, okay, that's not gonna work for me. Um, so we look at those people who, have, who understand that this is gonna take time, it's gonna take capital. Um, our other favorite one is the entrepreneur who says, this is the last round of capital I'm ever gonna need to raise, I'm gonna be profitable in three months. Like, okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, there was a slide earlier that showed sort of, I think it was like the entrepreneur's dilemma, right? Like a, a, a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. We, we use a spaghetti bowl uh, analogy of how, <laughs> there you go. Uh, of how we get, I didn't even do that on purpose. Uh, of how entrepreneurs get to their point because we don't know you know what route it's going to take and we're we're investing at such an early stage i mean our two one cultured meat business future meat we invested in the company didn't exist mm -hmm. until we invested in it and we carved it out of yusum university in, in tel aviv so um we don't know where we, we we have a gut feeling about the entrepreneur if they have a solid business plan that makes reasonable projections about where they're going to be and and they think thoughtfully about how are we going to get to scale who are the right partners? How do we geographically expand? Who are the right retail partners to go through? Um, when, and, and when you speak to them, you say, well, have you thought about this? And the people who say, I would never do that, we're less likely to invest with those people. Mm -hmm. The people who say, hmm, I didn't think about that, but that might be an interesting idea, who are just open, right? Open to, to other people's opinions, we, we appreciate that a lot more. It's less about the financial projections, because everyone in this room knows um, startups, we look at sort of one-year projections. Anything after 12 months is kind of useless um, mm -hmm. just because the companies change. They pivot, yeah. and they're going to have to spend more capital, and sales will go down, and they'll come back up. In your case, now that you have a lot of uh, startups around, what are you looking for? Yes. So, I mean, we are a little bit different, first of all, because we are much smaller, but second, because when we decided to start our corporate venture capital, it was more driven by the research and development department. So they, what we realized was that, I mean, there was immediately this new world of startups coming, so, and we had to capture this energy. It was a kind of perfect storming because, I mean, all the new ideas are coming, but maybe they don't have uh, the, the right way to the market. So we decided to open the door of Barilla through the venture capital, the corporate venture capital. So meaning we want to collaborate with startups, so we want to be able to test the solutions when it comes to new ingredients, new, new appliances, uh, new channels. Uh, in, the case, in some cases, uh, we can also think to invest as a minor investor in the startups when we see an alignment on this good for you, good for the planet, I mean, mission, vision that we, we have. And eventually, we also want to learn from startups the way they are working. And these, I mean, other people before were mentioning, I mean, difficulties that big companies are having to uh, trying to be fast and uh, for instance we are really trying to um, be start uppers and we have uh, i mean an example which is our blue rhapsody project which is uh, our uh, avant-garde pasta so it's a super premium pasta that we uh, try to develop using 3d printing so this is under the umbrella of blue 1877 so it's a it's a kind of protected project inside the company and using a lean startup approach to push this idea much more. Mm -hmm. And in this ecosystem that uh, we are building, there are different players like uh, the investors, which is uh, important, the startups. We have also the companies themselves, uh, the accelerators also, they can also play uh, an interesting, interesting role, which is the role of if it, uh, any of these, uh, of these players, can, how can they contribute to really foster innovation? So uh, I think that, I mean, the beauty of the food system is that it is already an ecosystem. So there is a supply chain. So there is, and, and if we want, uh, I mean, uh, to, let's say, improve this system, because we know that we need to improve, I mean, there are different players. And we have to accept the newcomers, and the newcomers have to accept that there is an existing ecosystem. So we have to find a way to collaborate. And uh, I think that accelerators, for instance, are very, very interesting place where to connect, where we as a company, as a corporate, we can connect 
with the newcomers. And uh, the only way out is to embrace each other. So we have to embrace innovation. And I mean, it could be new business models on existing food technologies. It might be uh, existing players using new solutions. So I mean, but that's the only way out for everybody, I think. So it's, and mm -hmm. we have to find our way uh, to, to meet, and this is again a, a very nice example of cooperation, collaborator, uh, collaborations, and networking. Yeah. How you collaborate with other players in the in the industry? Yeah, sure. So um, we we have my partner Reese and I. We both have a network of contacts from our time in venture capital and growth equity previously. So we farm that, and of course, it's going to be different partners because he was at Motorola doing doing um, law enforcement, technology investing. I was doing media, marketing, technology, investing. So it's a different space, but those generalist firms have people that focus on the food space. So it's connect with those individuals. It's get involved in the community. Chicago, where my office is located, um, has a ton of food businesses there. McDonald's is just moving their US headquarters out of the suburbs and into the city. Um, we have so Kella. you can act as a, a kind of hub. Exactly. Chicago is considered sort of the food hub in the United States. Um, so all the major brands are there. Um, there's great organizations like the Chicago Land Food and Beverage Association. We're members of that. We hosted a, a, an event at our, our offices with over 200 people from the mm -hmm. food industry. People from Kellogg all the way down to a brand new breakfast oatmeal company who's just starting out. And you see those people collaborating and talking together. Because those big brands understand that the disruption is coming from the startups. It's not, we're not disrupting each other anymore. Right? It's not, I mean, Purdue and Tyson can only fight so much, and it's like, who's got a bigger nugget in the frozen food section? That's, mm -hmm. that's art, in, that's art disrupting each other, but it's coming from companies like Beyond Meat, it's coming from companies like Memphis Meats, that's where the disruption's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so in, ingratiating yourselves into those organizations and explaining to these entrepreneurs, we are not here to um, sort of aqua hire you and then get rid of your company because we don't want the competition. We want to participate in our disruption. We want to be a part of that. So it's, it's a kind of attitude because yeah. in some industries, uh, some companies have the attitude of trying to avoid disruption to protect their business model. In this case, it's being open to disruption, yeah. knowing that maybe it's not coming to come from within my company, but uh, maybe um, putting the, the, the facilities to, yeah. to, to happen and, and to get introduced. Yeah, and that was very much the old corporate venture capital model in the US uh -huh. was mothership invests in a company, sucks a bunch of intellectual property out and just abandons the unit and leaves it mm -hmm. behind. Um, that model doesn't work anymore mm -hmm. because these startups, which are, which are so software and so technology focused, can get to scale pretty fast and all of a sudden they're eating, eating your lunch and you didn't, even, you didn't even see him coming. Okay. We already have a question over there. Okay, we have a question. Go ahead. You want the mic? <laughs> Come on, Michael. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. I have a, a question for Tom. Um, since you're an analyst and you, your company invested in cultured meat or how it's called clean meat, uh, how big would you, would you estimate the probability that uh, it will be available in American supermarkets until the end of the year? Because as you know, the CEO from uh, Impossible Food, I guess he, he said he promised it will be in the shelves until the end of the year. And what do you think? Between zero and 100. <laughs> What's less than zero? Okay, that's... <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just think, um, and, and we spend a ton of time on this space, um, and, and I think what it comes down to is you have two things. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion going on right now in the U.S. around regulation of even what can be called meat. Um, then, the, then there's the idea of consumer adoption. And I just, I don't know, being, I feel comfortable saying this because I am a U.S. consumer, I don't know how likely I would be to be the first person. Now, I, I have tried the product, but not in a, cooked it in my house. I tried a sample and had to sign a dozen waivers that say, if I die, I won't sue you. Um, so, I don't, I don't, I have no idea. I don't know, I heard the same thing at the end of last year. Um, I, think it was, I think it was the CEO of what used to be called Hampton Creek, is now called Just, um, was talking about, we're going to have cultured meat on the shelf at the end of 2017, and, and now it's, it's what, June, and no cultured meat on the shelf. So I, I just don't know. 
Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, I can add the question, so why is, in the, the, especially the meat industry, investing so much capital into those companies? Because uh, I also hear those predictions since years, uh, especially from maybe marketing uh, departments, but isn't that actually the wrong investment maybe? You're saying investing in culture meets the wrong investment? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I sure hope not. I made two of them. Um, <laughs> no, look, I, I would. I, I have called. I have called our investments in both Memphis Meats and Future Meat. Um, they're tuition payments for for Tyson right now. The technology is very, very early. The cost of production is obviously very, very high. We don't know what's going to happen. But if I fast forward ten years, and cultured meat has now taken twenty percent of the U.S. protein market. And someone turns to me and goes, hey, why weren't we aware of that? And I go, I don't know. I just didn't think it was going to happen. That's a really bad answer to yeah. give. <laughs> um, but, if, but if I say, you know what? We were there. We were there early. We spent a bit of money to understand it. And it didn't go anywhere. Then we've hedged our bets and we've protected our shareholders' capital, which is really we're fiduciaries of protecting that, that investment from our shareholders. Then we're doing our jobs. If it turns out to be a, a boon for the company, that's great. If it turns out to be nothing, we did our job. And this leads me to, to my next question is, um, is this uh, uh, food tech or food innovation uh, industry suitable for every kind of investor? Because we are not talking about software. We are not talking at the, about the same uh, timings, the same uh, scaling opportunities, the same commercialization uh, methodologies and everything. So. Probably not every investor is uh, prepared to the, these uh, special uh, characteristics of the of the food industry. Yeah, yes, I mean uh, maybe he is because I mean we are we are very very newcomer to investment. Anyways, I think that food industry is very different. You are absolutely right. So I mean mm, big return of investment. I mean I, I I don't think we can see big return this, of investment. This question maybe it's not the wrong yes, investment. Yes. It's no. just yeah. The time, yeah, and no, but I had a <laughs> one more consideration, which is, I mean, it's also uh, dangerous thinking about, for instance, when it when it comes to scale. So everybody say, okay, in the digital software, okay, you this is the proof of principle, then you can you can scale it. In the food industry, I mean, you have to think very carefully about scale because we are destroying the planet for the scale. So maybe in the food industry, the right scale is not the biggest scale. So, and this, I mean, is uh, because, I mean, it, it, it's a food system. So, and, and it's uh, the system which impacts uh, a lot the planet. And uh, so we have to be very, very careful, especially if we only take the perspective of the investors. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think it's for everybody. Um, I think you have to have the right platform to invest off of, and, and it was up on the slide before. Um, you have to have commitment from the top. So it, it can't be the pet project of a department head. It has to come down from the board, from the CEO's office, that we are going to do this. And oh, by the way, the resources of the company are at the disposal of the ventures team because that's the only way we can truly add value to these investments. Um, these folks have tremendous ideas and great dreams, but when it comes to the issue of scaling, um, you know, how, do you, how do you build facilities that can process 35 million chickens per week? We know how to do that. Um, those folks may not know how to do that, but may, they may have a better process for wastewater treatment or for uh, air quality control or for a new value add marinade for chicken, whatever it might mm -hmm. be. And I think we are run out of time, so just a very quick question. Do you see differences between the American and the European market in, uh, in terms of uh, innovation and investment in, in food tech and connected kitchen? Yes, absolutely. I, I see, I mean, the, the, the scale of investment is absolutely different. From a European perspective, I think that Europe is coming, maybe later, but it will, I mean, there will be more startups co coming from Europe. Uh, we have, uh, and this is I'm probably to be Italian, but I mean, I have to say we have many, many things to say when it comes to new products, food products and technologies, so I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think 99.8% of Tyson's business is U.S. focused. Um, we've made our first investment into Israel with Future Meat. We're looking to expand internationally, both as a company and as a ventures team. Um, so I do see a difference. Um, I see a lot more focus on personalized nutrition, I think, coming out of Europe than I do out of the U.S. The U.S. is more DNA focused, but here it's more flavor and food, which I like a lot better. There's a lot of issues with the, the mm -hmm. DNA databases I don't like. Um, but I, I think 
we're going to spend more time, uh, mm -hmm. both in both in the UK and Ireland and on the continent, because I think it's okay. a great place. Okay, so I think that maybe events like this one with a uh, great content and great uh, panelists like you and the rest of the one can help to balance uh, the situation. So thanks everybody for, for your attention and thanks for your patience for staying here until the last one. Yes, thank and, you. And uh, thank you, Mike. I think it's your turn right now.